Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin. I serve here as one of the pastors. And I think at this point, we might just be able to say amen and go home, right? <laughs> but we're not going to. Sorry. If you, uh, you want to follow with me, please take out your message notes uh, and grab a pen if you want to, uh, to follow along. This morning, we have experienced something powerful that God is doing uh, in Tina's life and in her friends across this whole weekend. And so now it's our turn. Uh, I want to spend a few minutes teaching about baptism and, and what that means uh, for us. But first, I'd like to pray, so uh, let's pray, and then we'll uh, jump into it. Pray with me. God, we thank you this morning for creating Tina and for giving her life. And we thank you for how you have blessed us in a powerful way uh, through how you're working in her life and reminding us how you're at work in ours, too. And uh, I believe, Lord, that you have a sermon for every person in the house today. It might have little or even nothing to do with the words I've prepared, and that's why we ask you, Holy Spirit, be our teacher and be our wisdom today. We pray in Jesus' name. Everyone agreed and said, amen. amen. So on my phone, uh, it, it sets uh, reminders. Uh, does your phone do this? Do you have something like this, like it buzzes or alerts you? I, I have come to both love and fear these reminders on my phone. I use them for everything, for, uh, for bills, for the kids' activities, for meetings, for when I got to put salt in that thing by the softener inside of my house for, for all this stuff, I, I set a reminder to go off uh, when the Wildcats begin their next championship run. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No. I mean, when the college basketball season begins, you know. Um, I, I even uh, set a, a reminder that goes off every morning that reminds me to take a shower and put on deodorant. I'm just kidding. It's Pastor Wes. Everyone knows this, but... So I got a new phone, and it came with this added feature called Family Reminders. This is where my wife, Ashley, can set up a reminder without me knowing that shows up and goes off on my phone, even though I never realized it got scheduled. Like I said, I've come to love and fear these, <laughs> these reminders. Let me ask you a question. It's not a trick question. Why do I set up reminders on my phone? Say it louder, Danielle. I heard you. Say it louder. She said, so I don't forget. I don't trust myself not to forget, it, it, even with things that are really important. But the, the reason is, is because I, I get, can get so distracted and, and so busy. I, just, I need to ha have something that, that cuts through the clutter, literally buzzes in my pocket and sends off a, a sound, an alert, to get my attention for something that's important that I want to remember. I, I actually had one of those go off um, this uh, weekend uh, my wife and I are about to celebrate our 12th wedding anniversary just a week um, from now. Yes. Yes, she is a gracious and patient uh, woman. And uh, I put that in there, by the way, not for you. I put that in there for her because she's with us right now. And yes, honey, I did, I did remember. But you do this in your life. You, you, you remind yourself of things that are important. You do. Uh, let me do a survey. Prove it to you. How many of us take something like a child's birthday, parents, birth, siblings' birthday, a uh, wedding anniversary date like me, and then uh, write it on a calendar, but not only that, maybe even plug it into a phone or even into social media, like into a Facebook calendar. How many of us do that with these? All right, great, well, you can put your hands down. It, but see, if you're like me, I have each of these dates memorized, and yet I still set them. Why? Because I don't trust myself not to remember, I, I, not to forget. I don't trust myself to remember. Do you know that this happens uh, with our spiritual lives, um, too? I mentioned that we can get distracted and busy, and what can happen for me is I can start wandering from one distraction, one urgent crisis, to the next in my life. I love the way that one of my favorite hymns, an old song, puts it. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Look at this lyric. It says, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So today... Let's stop our wandering just for a few moments spiritually and, and let's remember our baptisms because baptism reminds us who we are. You know, baptism, it's a, it's a once-in-a-lifetime event that we spend the rest of our lifetimes 
living into. Baptism, it launches us on this ongoing journey of of immersing, plunging ourselves deeper and deeper down into God's grace and his love in our lives. Baptism is not an end point. No, it's a beginning point that from that point forward in my life, I'm moving closer and closer toward the presence, toward the holiness of God. This is baptism in our lives. It reminds us who we are. You know, we uh, do a great job celebrating birthdays, and we should, graduations, anniversaries. But let me suggest something else today. What if today we, we took a few minutes, and maybe not even just today, but in the days to come, what if we celebrated and remembered our baptism day when God worked in our lives and, and made us into daughters and sons of the, the Most High God? Uh, so Martin Luther, do you remember your history? Martin Luther, he lived from 1483 to 1546. George, you remember. Um, and <laughs> so Martin Luther was a, a Catholic priest, a faithful priest, who he wanted to bring new life into dead churches. This is life mission. Now, I know this is shocking. He picked up a few critics uh, along the way, and it led to some really bad days in his life. He wrote some songs. We still sing them sometimes in church today. And, and I think after one of his really bad days, he wrote this line. He said, And though this world with devils filled would threaten to undo us. Have you ever been there? Yeah, I have too. But so what Martin Luther would do on his uh, bad days, he would find the nearest church, he would go in and go up to the baptismal font, dip his hand in the water, make the sign of the cross on his forehead, and he would say out loud, I am baptized. On his really bad days, he would say it again louder, I am baptized. And on his worst of the worst days, people thought he was nuts. He would shout, I am baptized. A few years ago, we gave out uh, shower tags. Uh, I have one that uh, it, it just reminds us that we're baptized as a Bible verse, a, a simple baptism prayer on it. Uh, you know, the idea is that we pick this up from Martin Luther, is the idea is every time that, that the water would hit our skin, it were, would remind us that I can't tell you how many days I've walked into our master bath first thing in the morning, the water has hit my skin, and I've had to say out loud to God and to myself, I am baptized. Friends, let's remember our baptism today. It reminds us who we are because baptism, it's just as much about us saying yes to God as it is celebrating the God who has already said yes to us. This is why at the, uh, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, there's a story. We have four accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four of them, they tell us the story that at the beginning of his ministry, before Jesus had done anything else really, that he goes out to the Jordan River and he finds his cousin, John the Methodist, I mean John the Baptist, and so John immerses him, baptizes him in, in the water of the Jordan River. And do you remember the story? That uh, let me let me tell you what happens in Matthew's Matthew's version, Matthew chapter three verse seventeen. It says that, that, that you know the heavens open up, a dove comes and rests over Jesus, and a voice from heaven declares this. Let's say this out loud. Ready, go. This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. You know this happens before Jesus has called his first disciple, before he's preached his first sermon, before he's performed his first miracle, written his first book, or graduated from college, or funded his retirement. I could go before Jesus has done anything to achieve or, or, or earn or deserve this love. It's freely given to him, and that is the point, because it is baptism. The Father, the Holy Spirit, come together with the Son to show us a love that we do not have to earn or deserve or achieve or accomplish. It's not about us. It's about this gift that God has given us, not because of us, because of him, his love. His grace in our lives, my brothers, my sisters, remember your baptism. <clears throat> Paul writes a beautiful passage uh, about the power and the meaning of baptism. That's what I want to take us to today. If you want to follow, turn in your message notes. It comes in Romans chapter 6. Listen to what Paul writes. Well then, should we just keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. 
Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in, what's the next word in the text? Baptism. Baptism. We joined him in his, his death. I've heard it said uh, that sin is so deadly, so dangerous, that it has to be drowned to kill it. What he writes next. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been, say the next word. You might want to underline or circle that word. I'm going to teach about this for a minute. Since we've been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life uh, as he was. Now this word is interesting. There's, uh, Paul's writing in Greek. There's several ways he could have said united or joined. That's how our English Bibles say it, uh, that, that he could have chosen but he doesn't go there. He chooses a really different, this, the word he chooses, it only shows up one time in the entire Bible right here in this verse that you're looking at. And it's this word that you see on the screen. It's this Greek word. It's pronounced symphutos. Everyone say symphutos. Go. Symphutos. You just spoke ancient Greek. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Fellow nerds, we think that's cool, but just play along. So symphutos. <laughs> it's, this, it's this Greek word, and you know what it literally translates to if you break it down in English? Grow together. It's an agricultural uh, term. I was fascinated. I looked it up. It, 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 the Greek farmers, the ancient Greek farmers, would use it to describe a process today that we call grafting. Are any of you familiar with grafting or know what this is or heard about it? A few of us. Okay, if, if you're not, let me explain. The way that this would work in ancient Greece is uh, the farmers maybe would have a plant or a tree that would have deep, healthy roots. And over here, they would have a plant that would uh, have, uh, you know, buds or branches that, that would produce fruit that they desired. And so symphutos was when they would literally cut out a bud or a branch from this tree this plant with the fruit, they would bring it over here and they would graft it symphutos into the plant, the tree with healthy roots so that over time, what would happen? You'd have this plant and this plant come together and make what? One new plant that would eventually bear what? Jesus once said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit. Friends, when you're baptized, it's the master gardener grafting you as a branch from over here and then implanting you into the vine who who has healthy roots. It's like a dormant branch being planted into a healthy vine and then he allows the Holy Spirit to flow into our soul like sap through a stem so that you and I can can bear good fruit. See, when we're baptized, it's, it's this old in us that dies so that a new creation can come to life. When we're baptized, you and I are sealed and marked as daughters and sons of the Most High God. When you and I are baptized, my friends, We are adopted as children into a new tribe, a new family. Are there any Christians here besides, there's a couple right here. This is good. (laughs) This is good news, yes? All right. See, then Paul tells us what this transformation looks like. Look what he writes next. We'll pick it up in verse six. He says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that what? Sin might lose its power. In our lives, we are no longer slaves to sin. Yeah. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. He will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Would you read the last sentence with me? Go. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. When we are baptized, we are united. We are symphutos with the death and the burial of Jesus so that we can join with him in his resurrection and live as free children of God. In the 1800s, uh, there was a group of Benedictine monks and they were uh, on the pioneer edge of the American colonies 
uh, that had just now started to, to form into a nation. And they were uh, not far from present-day Charlotte, North Carolina, when they decided to establish a, a monastery. They called it Belmont Abbey. It still exists. It's still in operation today. When the monks got to the village, though, they came across this really large granite stone that had been placed at the main crossroad in town. They were curious. They found out the history of this place, this crossroad. They learned that this location had at one time been the place where slaves were sold. Not only that, but that the stone that they saw there, that it was actually the, the stone where the slaves were chained while they were being auctioned. Men, women, even children would stand on that rock and be sold into slavery. So the monks did something kind of surprising. They, they asked for permission and they got it to, to take the stone and transport it from where it was in the village, up the hill to their monastery. They placed it in the monastery. They carved out a big hole in the middle of the rock, and they made it their baptismal font. You see a picture of it right now? They placed an inscription, a plaque, right there by it that says this. Upon this rock, people were once sold into slavery. Now upon this rock, through the waters of baptism, men and women and children become free children of God friends. Remember your baptism. When I was born, my parents uh, gave me attention. They gave me clothes, and, uh, food. My parents gave me a home. My parents even gave me my name. But when I was baptized, my heavenly father gave me my identity. Identity. I am a child of God and a person of worth. Remember your baptism, friends. Would you just sink deep in the water? Would you let his love wash over you? As you seek his face, would you let him give you everything you need? You just sang this. Jesus Christ, you are my one desire to know you all my life at our baptism. We receive our identity. My name can only get me so far in life, but his name gets me full access to the kingdom of God. Uh, so last month, I took my family on a vacation. I'm sorry, I have three children. Uh, we went on a trip. You can't really call it a vacation. <laughs> the parents are laughing right now. <laughs> um, it, so we went over to the other coast of Florida to the beach, spent uh, several days there. And early in our week, uh, one of my sons, I have a daughter and then two young sons, one of them uh, scraped his leg pretty bad on a seashell. And uh, it was enough to kind of, it was bleeding, there was kind of a little bit of a wound there. He was okay, but what happened, it was early in our week, and at, after that happened, he hesitated to, to go out into the, into the Atlantic Ocean. Into the, he was afraid that the water would uh, hurt and make the wound worse. So I found myself getting down on his level, looking him in the eye and saying, Jake, no, that, that water, it will clean your wound. Son, you need to plunge yourself into the water as long as you can every day because there is where you will find healing. Friends, remember your baptism today. I wonder if some of you came in here with a scraped leg this morning or a bruised body, or a weary and wounded soul. There's healing here in this place. Why? Because Jesus is alive, and he's with us, and it's his brokenness. Did you know that? That heals us. That God sent his son into the world to suffer, to die on a cross, to be buried, so that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life it's his brokenness that heals us I met uh, a young woman last night who has a scrape she came to church for the first time in her life and what brought her here was she's in a relationship right now that's slowly destroying her self worth and her self image I have two friends that reached out to me in the past couple of days and said Kevin help I am powerless to stop looking at things that are inappropriate online. It's getting worse, and now it's affecting my marriage and my family. Some of us are scraped up and banged up today. 
I have a couple of dear friends right now who are battling cancer. Some of us are, are scraped up. And I believe that there's someone here today who the fire has started to go out. You're starting to turn away from the God you love. You're starting to let go of that joy of your first salvation. You say that you're a follower of Jesus, but you're dying inside right now because you know you're not living it out. Friends, if you're here today, scraped up, banged up, do you remember your identity, your baptism? Because it's his grace that heals our sin-sick bodies and our wounded, weary souls. It's not the water. The water's not magic. See, the water is a symbol, powerful symbol that God uses. It's not about the water. It's about what Christ does in us and through us. Every time that we remember we've been immersed, we've been plunged, that we've sunk deep in this love that washes over us. It's what he does in us through this. So in the Methodist Church, um, we celebrate two uh, sacraments, sacred moments, baptism, and communion, where we believe that we experience the presence and the power of God in a powerful and also very mysterious way. It's interesting how baptism and communion, these two sacred moments, they bookend the life of Jesus, don't they? Baptism at the beginning of his ministry, and then communion, the last supper when, and the last night that he shared with his disciples like us. These gifts that he's given us to remind us who we are. You know, there's a common link between baptism and communion. Do you know what it is? Every time that we take communion, every time we remember our baptism, we are joined, united with Christ in his death, in his burial, so that we can join with him in his resurrection and live as free children of God. Remember your baptism. If you've never been baptized... Can you pretend for a second like it's just me and you in the room talking as friends? If you've never been baptized, Jesus will transform you like he's transformed me. I believe that this isn't, I believe there's someone here today that today can become the day of your salvation for you to know Jesus Christ to receive your new identity as a daughter and son of God. If that's the case, for you in a moment, uh, when we do what we're gonna do next, would you find me or Pastor Wes or Pastor George so that we can help you take the next step? And for all of us, uh, what we wanna do today is I don't just wanna talk about baptism. I want you to physically remember uh, your baptisms. You see stations around the sanctuary. So in just a moment, Pastor George will give you more instructions on how we'll do it. Uh, But you're going to come forward to one of these stations. And when you get there, you'll see communion, but you'll also see a bowl of water. In the bowl of water uh, are pieces of sea glass. They look like this. Sea glass, um, it's really interesting. It, It comes from... Uh, Pieces of broken, shattered bottles and glass used on ships over the past couple hundred years to transport goods in the oceans. When the glass would shatter, which was often, they would cast it off literally as trash. And then it would immerse in the water for a long time and the forces of erosion would work on the glass. It would start to smooth off the edges and transform something that was literally trash into something that's now a treasure. Something that was broken into something that is beautiful. Friends, remember your baptism. When you come forward, we want you to actually take a piece of sea glass and keep it with you. Take it, keep it from this day forward as a reminder of who you are. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for giving us these gifts of communion and baptism that remind us of your presence in our lives. Would you meet with us here today as we experience your grace and your love in our lives? We pray in Jesus' name, amen.